first uh, to just to Hello? Yes. Uh, first, just to update that last point in the film, in 2014, a settlement was re reached with the five wrongfully convicted men for $41 million. This was a long time coming, 11 years. Do you think it happened in part because it was a kind of campaign promise by Mayor Bill de Blasio to end the litigation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we the film came out in, in 2012 and 13, and um, I think that it was sort of, there was a new conversation about it at that point, and people were talking about it again, and when the mayoral election happened in New York City, um, actually one of the other candidates kind of raised it as an issue, and so it came up, and we actually went to an event that Bill de Blasio was at as he was fundraising, and we asked him publicly, will you settle the Central Park Five case? And he said, Yes, that that was a priority of his, and sure enough, because um, Bloomberg he, had fought it. Bloomberg had fought it. I mean, I don't know how personally involved Bloomberg was, but the Bloomberg administration was not, did not want to settle the case, and his corporation counsel, who's the sort of civil lawyer for the city, um, was was fighting it, and that's why it had gone on for a decade. Um, and so when De Blasio came in, he appointed his new corporation counsel, and they had a press conference that you know, the day he was appointed. And they said, We're, the two priorities are settling the stop and frisk case and settling the Central Park Five case. And they did within the year. The, uh, they had originally asked for 50 million each. Um, here it was distributed kind of according to the amount of time served. Mm -hmm. So uh, Corey Wise, who was 16 at the time and was sentenced uh, to, actually spent, we sentenced, I think, five to About 15, 13. but served almost 13 years, uh, received 12 and a quarter million, and then each of the others got seven and uh, an eighth million, or about basically about a million dollars for each year of time served. What did you think of that? Um, I thought it was pretty extraordinary. I mean, it was um, precedent setting. Um, that was more than I think anyone, in certainly in New York, had, had ever gotten in an unusually large um, settlement amount, and I think that that was because the the De Blasio had come in and said this is this is a priority where we want to do this, and and there was a new a new sense of that administration that it was the right thing to do and not just something they were doing because they were being sued and <laughs> wanted to 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 make it go away. Um, so it was uh, unusual, and it's been a big change for them. Do you happen to know how they spend the money? Um, they, well, I don't know exactly, but they, um, they all opted to do kind of structured settlements, so it's coming to them over time. Um, but still, I mean, it's life-changing money, and so they've, a few of them have moved, actually three of them now live in Georgia. Um, uh, Antron and Raymond are practically neighbors. They, you know, they didn't know each other before any of this happened, and when they were on trial together, they became very close, and um, in fact, I think one of the photos that we use in there was actually a Polaroid that Antron had sent to Raymond while they were in two different juvenile facilities, and it says on the back, to my little brother Raymond from your brother Antron, and they, after they got out, talked on the phone daily, basically. I mean, they became incredibly close, and they now live in the same town in Georgia, and Antron moved his mom down there, and you know, it's it's because um, they, nice. they'd be in their early forties now, I would yeah. guess. Yeah. As is common in these kinds of settlements, the city didn't uh, admit to any wrongdoing, okay. um, and no one, not the prosecutors or detectives or uh, anyone from that side of it, ever apologized. Did that surprise you? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> I mean, I think you know, and I think it's what Jim Dwyer gets to there in the end of the film: this sense of. Um, you know, whether you, the blue wall or whatever it is, the sense of protecting these kind of institutions even when they get it wrong. And um, there is, and I think also what, what, he, what he talks about there, just that sense that admitting that you got this wrong means not just saying I was wrong, but also having to come to grips with what that actually means because of that. And um, so I'm not surprised. Um, but one thing that was really amazing about our experience of sharing the film, and I think for the five, their experience of sharing their stories in a kind of public way, a new way, and actually that began, I will say, in this very room, 
where we had an early um, film festival screening here. Um, and it was the first time any of the five had ever come to a just open public screening of the film. Raymond Santana was here for that five, six years ago. And um, it was pretty extraordinary. I don't think the audience knew that he was there. And so when they introduced us at the end and then introduced him, everyone gave him a standing ovation. And he was, I mean, it took him a while to compose himself after that um, because he, I think it was the first time he'd ever been in a big room full of people who knew who he was, who were celebrating him and not hating him. And it was incredibly moving. And people came up afterwards and wanted to hug him. And one of the things that happened many times when we did Q&As with them um, was people would say, I don't, have a, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. You know, I followed this case when it happened. I was in New York or whatever. I was reading the papers. And I assumed you were guilty. And I just want to say, I'm sorry. And so even though the police and prosecutors, none of those people ever apologized to them. I think the experience of sharing their stories and getting that back, those apologies, those kind of responses was hugely meaningful for them. Uh, what about the media? As is said in the film, uh, a lot more attention was paid to the presumed guilt of these men rather than their proven innocence. Um, what could they do differently? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot. <laughs> um, I think very few people were asking the right questions at that time. I would like to think that we are a little bit more skeptical now um, in the media and, and in general about these kind of police narratives. I think a lot of that is, is relatively recent and has to do with how many times we've now seen cell phone videos of police misconduct, of police brutality, and I think that we, that, that has allowed us maybe to better recognize the fact that you can't always trust the narrative that you get from the police. And so I'd like to think that we would do better today, that the media would do better today, but I think in many ways not much has changed also. And so um, that's one thing. But I also think that since since the film has come out and since there's been a little more conversation since the, the settlements, while there are still people who claim they still believe they're guilty, um, uh, including Donald yeah. Trump, <laughs> um, that there is, I think, a larger sense. I mean, I, you know, I saw a Google alert for the Central Park Five, and I think every day I get an email that mentions the case. And most of the time it's in the context of using the Central Park Five as an example of Donald Trump's racism going back historically. Um, but the fact that it's even on that list suggests that people now know and think of it as a wrongful conviction, a terrible injustice. Um, but, uh, you know, whether we would make the same mistake again, sure, absolutely. But at least New York doesn't have the death penalty. There's that. <laughs> Small let, consolation. Let, yeah. Let, let's go back to the beginning. In 1989, you were six years old. Um, you were living in rural New Hampshire, uh, obviously not aware of what was going on in New York. But tell me a little bit more about learning the family business, that early osmotic immersion <laughs> in filmmaking. What, what's your earliest memory of that? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, I, I was not aware of this case. I grew up in this very small town where my parents had moved um, from New York, basically, to a place where they could live and make films and not need day jobs. Um, and so I grew up in this tiny town. I think there's more cows than people there. Um, but it was very much in, as you said, it was in my house, you know, and the, the picture I've, I know that picture well, like standing above the Steenbeck. And I, it, so it, it was very much a part of it. But when I, as I got a little bit older, I became more engaged in the, and interested in the process. And I don't think I was like planning to be a filmmaker. I just, that's what was around. And I used to get off the, the school bus and go to the house where they had set up once they moved out of our house to this editing house just kind of hang out there with the editors and go get them candy and sort of spend time in that space. Um, but I have really strong memories. The earliest is, I don't know if this is my earliest memory, but maybe the most vivid is of um, 
watching a screening, an internal screening, you know, during the editing process with all the consultants for this series on the history of baseball that my dad made. Um, and so this would have been the early 90s. I was maybe 10 years old and sat through this, you know, week long thing where you watch an episode and then you talk about it and all the consultants, the historians or whatever come. Um, and end of having sort of getting up the courage to like raise my hand and make a comment about which photograph I thought I thought maybe you should cut in on this one instead of going out of this thing of Jackie Robinson, ironically enough, who I later made a film about with my dad. Um, well, you had a, you had a role in that. I did. Movie. I was also yes. They <laughs> also filmed my you know third grade softball team. So there's some montage of kids playing baseball that you can spot me in there if you're looking really carefully. Did you like that? Did you love movies? Did you like watching movies? Did you see? I did. I loved, and I loved that process. I mean, I think I think that's why that memory stuck with me the most. Was it was less about like going to the movie theater and seeing a movie, and it was about being in that room with this whole group of people discussing how to make it better. Um, and that I think really captured my attention. And to this day, that is my I think my favorite part of the process of filmmaking are those days when we all sit down, our team, and sometimes other people, consultants, and we watch the film, and then we go page by page through our script and re figure out how the puzzle pieces fit together. But I, as, uh, as you alluded to, you, initially you weren't planning to become a filmmaker. You didn't, but you, at, when you started in Yale, you, were, you started in film studies? I was thinking about film studies, and I had, I mean, I'd, I had grown up with film, and I was interested in film, not necessarily documentary, I just loved watching movies, and I thought that film studies sounded like a lot of fun. Um, and so I started, I started there, I took the intro film studies course, and I didn't love it. Um, and I didn't love the professor, and I didn't love the kids, <laughs> it was like not, didn't quite fit. And so I sort of flipped through the course book, and the classes that most caught my attention were the American Studies classes. And I completely missed at the time the fact that I was just switching from the medium of my dad's work to the content. <laughs> did not, it, didn't, it did not occur to me at that moment at all. Um, I sort of took me a while to figure that out. But again, I think it's, that's what I had been exposed to in some way and I was interested in race and so I, focused on African-American studies within that, and that kind of in this roundabout way led me back to, ultimately, to, to filmmaking. But you first heard about the Central Park Five in 2003 when you were a kind of intern at a, at a law firm that was involved in preparing the civil suit. So were you thinking of becoming a lawyer? I was. I was, um, I was considering it, and I, I had gotten this job at this tiny little civil rights law firm, because that was the kind of law I was interested in. And so I, um, it was kind of random. It was like a, someone I knew from college was family, friends, and I called this guy and I said, can I come and work for you? And he's like, are you sure you want to do that? And I, so it, it sort of worked and it, it turned into the next <laughs> 10 years of my life. I was, I mean, I got as far as taking the LSAT and then never applied to law school because I, um, I spent this summer working for them before my senior year in college and learned about this case for the first time. Um, and it had all of the things to it, to this story that I was interested, that I had been studying, that I was interested in studying. I knew I wanted to write my senior essay about a sort of 20th century African-American studies subject. I like had my advisor, I just didn't have my subject yet. And so I learned about this case and I met Raymond and Kevin briefly, and um, I became kind of fascinated by it. And so I wrote this paper, my, my senior essay, it was about the, the racism in the media coverage. Um, and, and then I couldn't uh, let go of it. I went back to work for the lawyers. I was still thinking about law school. And at some point, I realized that I had to kind of follow this story. And what I'd written for that paper was sort of only one chapter of the story. Uh, about the media coverage of, of yeah. the case. That, so so you, instead of going to law school, you decide to write a book. Now, if, if you had a different father, I'd say, what did your parents say? But, in, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, why did you want to dedicate yourself to this case? You know, in some ways, it was the same instinct that made me want to go to law school, I think, which is that I had 
since, I mean, my parents used to joke about it. It was sort of a, they made fun of me kind of, but my, my sense of fairness was acute. And so, and I think that's, you know, terribly annoying when you're five years old or whatever. But I think that in some ways that kind of carried through and um, it's what made me interested in the law and in civil rights law. And it's what made me interested in telling the story, which was just a sense that, I used to say this often when I would introduce the film at screenings, because I would, you sort of, you don't, I mean, it's not, I hope you enjoy the film. I mean, what, and, I, and so the thing I often used to say was, when I first learned about this story, it made me angry, and I hope it makes you angry too. Um, and that was the feeling. I mean, I, I learned about this case. I'd been kind of aware of some of these. It's, there's a, a through line of dealing with race in America in many of my dad's films, and I had sort of followed that stuff. But when I got to know this story more, it um, made me angry. And it felt like this was a story that people didn't know um, or didn't know the real version of, and I wanted to tell it, the rest of it. Because I mean, what you said is that one of your goals was to try to understand the broader forces that shaped the outcome of the case, and to figure out, as you say, a simple but nagging question: How did this happen? Yeah, and I think that's you know one thing I thought about in the book, and certainly in the film. And one of the the um, the opening scene of the film is this this sort of disembodied voice of Matthias Reyes, the actual perpetrator, and. We made that decision really early on to put that at the top because we wanted it to be clear always that this was about how did this happen and not a whodunit. And that that was, that we never wanted to sort of manipulate the audience in any way to have some question about what did they do it or not because that was not the point of telling the story. We could say up front they didn't do it and then the film becomes about why did this happen? How did this happen? Um, and I think that's, I mean, and that's the sort of American studies background maybe, but this, this sense of like, how do all of these things intersect to bring us to this point? The interrogation techniques that are commonly used, I mean, there's, they're, they're in a book. I mean, there's a, the technique, um, uh, but also the, the racism that allows everyone to so easily assume that these kids are guilty, um, the media that just accepts this narrative coming from the police and then runs with it because it sells papers and because it sounds right to them and without asking, without doing their jobs, without asking those questions. Um, and so I think there's, there's plenty of blame to go around. So I read somewhere that initially Mateus Race was going to be on camera but then changed his mind. Well, what what... What's the story there? Yeah, I, I started by writing him letters. He's serving a life sentence um, in upstate New York for these other crimes uh, that he committed after this one. Um, and I started writing him letters, trying to get an interview or talk to him. And he eventually agreed. It was clear that he'd gotten some, this was the civil suit was still going on, and it's clear that he'd gotten some pressure not to talk to me. Um, but eventually... From, don't know. <laughs> I don't know, you could them, only guess <laughs> the city um, yeah. and so uh, even that initially we were going to go and have a kind of official meeting with him at the prison like a journalist you know thing and then that we couldn't do anymore and so we had to just show up like a regular visitor kind of and just meet him in the the visiting room where everyone else was was um, having their, their meetings um, and so we sat, my, my partner, Dave, and I um, sat with him for three hours, and it was um, kind of fascinating. I mean, in the end, not that, not that helpful to us, but um, I mean, he's a sociopath, and he talked basically nonstop, um, and he felt like he, he, he was saying, I think, what he thought we wanted to hear. So he said a lot of stuff like, I'm a monster and I don't ever deserve to get out. But he also said, and I did it and I, you know, but, and he seemed to somehow relate to the guys, but only in this sense, in the five, but only in the sense that he saw the system, the, the pro, you know, the police and the prosecutors and stuff as like a common enemy. And so he could 
like in he could help them by being against the same you know these bad guys which of course conflicts with his idea that he doesn't ever deserve to get out if he sees the system that put him in jail as as a bad you know it didn't totally make sense but he did say that he would give us an interview and then later an on-camera interview and then later changed his mind i think in part because they um the new york post published an excerpt of my book before it came out um, about him, that sort of focused on him. It was like a few sections of the book about him. Um, the Post, of course, was interested in this sort of salacious details of his crimes. And um, I think he didn't like that. And that may have been why he didn't end up giving us the interview. But, um, it, you know, we, we were lucky to have found this recording of him confessing it was like to a private investigator that someone we kind of had to, it was sort of sneaky how we ended up with it really? but yeah I um s someone had a copy of this tape and shared it with us um but that made a big difference because it was important to us that we as I said at the from the beginning from the outset set up the fact that he did it and he said he did it and that we weren't going to leave that an open question until the end I think that the first obstacle, just going back to writing the book, not even making the film, would be to win the trust of the five. How did you go about that? Yeah, um, time. I think um, when I first approached them, I to, when I was working on the book, I didn't really interview them for the paper. I mean, I was doing microfilm research for the paper. When I first started working on the book, I approached them and asked, and I had, you know, I had worked with one of these lawyers who was involved, so I kind of had a connection, but I was still, I was like 23, and had no, re like, there was no reason for them to trust me, um, and given what they'd been through, especially, and surprisingly, they all, the five, all kind of right away said, yeah, I'll talk to you. Sure, that sounds good. And I was a little bit shocked, um, given the media coverage and, and all of that. But I think they all felt like, and I think they, would, they later would say that, you know, nobody else was kind of interested in their story. And the idea that someone wanted to tell the story and had some, I mean, I'd written this paper and could kind of talk about it, and they felt like I knew what I was talking about. Um, was was enough for them to trust me a little bit enough to say okay their family members were much more skeptical um and many some of them didn't never talk to me um i think they were more scarred by the media coverage even than the five um and and carried those scars with them but it took time and so the first time i sat down with each of them i remember sitting with raymond for the first time in his lawyer's office. And it was very, I mean, he answered my questions, but it was sort of perfunctory and like not, um, we were not going, and I, and I didn't start with deep, heavy questions. Um, what did you start with? Oh God, I don't remember. But I mean, I think it was pretty straightforward sort of factual stuff. What do you remember about this? And what was the, you know, when were you in this place? And you know, what? where did you serve, and like things, mm -hmm. probably some stuff I already knew the answers to, but just sort of starting to talk. And so that first, I'm sure that first interview with Raymond did not produce very much that was useful. Um, but it was just the beginning of a process. And then, you know, over the couple of years, I interviewed each of them a bunch of times, but I was always really amazed at their willingness even to just sit down with me. And that then, of course, the fact that by the time we started working on the film, there was some relationship. I wouldn't say we were close or friends or anything, but I mean, there was some level of trust. There was some work that we'd gone through and they had a com more of a comfort level with me and what I sort of thought of the case and knew about the case and so. Did they read the book? They, uh, by, the book wasn't out yet by the time we oh, did by the, that. When you were starting so by the time the, we okay. filmed the interviews, there was some overlap of mm -hmm. like the, I mean, I, maybe I had sort of finished writing it or right. close to it um, when we started filming, but they hadn't read the book then. But they did trust me by then mm -hmm. enough. And I think that 
they also approached the interviews. I mean, we interviewed Corey twice, but otherwise it was just one one interview. And they, um, I think, saw that, the on-camera interview, as an opportunity to, as, as a kind of singular opportunity to tell their stories. Like, this is my chance, and it's going to be hard and not fun, but it's important, and I want to do it. And, I, I mean, they're all, they're very different personalities and everything, but I think each of them had some version of that feeling of like, okay, whew, I need to do this. And they, I mean, I think what they gave us in those interviews was even way beyond what they'd ever given me in, in the for interviews the, the before book. that yeah. for the book, because I think there was some, I think they had that sense that this was important in a different way. And in a way it's a direct address to, to an audience, not just yeah. talking to you. And I think they understood that and it, and it was, they knew that that was the moment to get, I mean, I think they got more, most of them got more emotional in that setting than they had in other interviews. Um, and so that was, that was really extraordinary. And you do on trial testimony and Trisha Maley's own book, I Am a, the Central Park Jogger. I assume you tried to speak to her? We did, we approached her, but uh, you know, her focus has always been in her book and in general, I mean, she's b become a kind of, um, inspirational speaker and she talks to groups and stuff so it's not that she doesn't address it but her focus is really about her recovery because she had no memory of the actual attack um, her book is about how she came back from a traumatic brain injury and that's what her message is about and what her her conversation is about and so I think and I also think that she's not totally um, certain about what happened um, you know she the police and prosecutors who worked on this case were the people who were supporting her and trying to protect her. And I think that I imagine that she has some uh, sort of trusting relationship mm -hmm. with them. And that's complicated to learn uh, many years later that there's a different version of the story. Um, so she politely declined. Something I wondered about, though, I mean, you sort of address it, is why them? I mean, more than 30 young men were in the park that night. Um, none of these five I mean, had prior run-ins with the authorities. I mean, they were very young anyway, but none was ID'd by the, the other people who were attacked, the joggers and cyclists. Yeah. Uh, was it just bad luck? I mean, why, why them? I actually think that it was their relative innocence that made them most vulnerable. So... There were, among those other kids in the park, were kids who had been in trouble before or had some knew more about the system. There was one kid who had an aunt or other close relative, I forget, who worked in corrections and who sort of told him not to talk to the police. Like, there, some of these kids are a kid who'd been arrested before. And so I think some of these other kids um, just weren't as vulnerable to these techniques. So I think that a lot of them face some of these same interrogation things and I think that they the police could have came to focus on these guys kind of randomly out of the group in large part because less so Yusef who was a little savvier um, but in the end these guys were more naive um, their families were more naive and um, they believed the police they, they didn't think the police would lie to them and so they believed the police when the police said Someone in the other room is saying, you did it, and you can just go home if you tell us what you did. And so I think that actually had a lot to do with it. And there's actually some studies that suggest that. I think Saul Kasson, who's in the film, <clears throat> does, has, has done a lot of studies around false confessions. And there's, there's research that suggests that innocence is actually a factor in making you vulnerable to a false confession. I mean, one of the things that drew you into the ca into the case was false confessions. I mean, I mean, why would anyone make a false yeah. confession? And you outlined very well how these experienced New York police are at eliciting confessions, but do you understand why they wouldn't be so good at figuring out whether they're true or not? <laughs> yeah, it's a really... I mean, when I, <clears throat> when I first started writing the book, I actually got a, a, a small advance to write one chapter because I had never written anything before. And I, the publisher sort of said, let's just try this out and see. Um, and so I chose to write for that chapter, not the first chapter of the book, but the chapter about the interrogations and false confessions. And I think I chose that 
because both because it could kind of stand on its own as it as something as part of the story, but mainly because I felt like I really had to understand that myself really well. I had to understand. In some ways, it's the hardest part of this this story to understand is why does someone falsely confess? And I feel like I had to wrap my head around that before I could work on any other part of the story. And the so I started by reading, I mean, the, the, the manual, the guide, the read technique, which is how these interrogations are kind of founded, um, or, the, or the basis for the, this interrogation style. Um, and there have been many editions of this book over the years, but it all kind of comes down to a similar stuff, which is essentially a, a, a slightly more complicated version of, of, it's actually bad cop, good cop. Um, that's a big factor in it. But... So I, I read a lot of that. I read a lot of these studies about false confessions, other examples of how they happened and, and why um, youth also is a big factor, right, um, in, in false confessions. But I really, yeah, I felt like I had to understand that because it is so irrational. Um, but I think when, like, when we were making the film, Raymond was one of the early interviews we did. And we walked out of the interview with Raymond and felt like, okay, we have a film. Because, I mean, he both just tells his story so beautifully, but especially he explains what happened in the interrogation and why he confessed in a way that I, we felt like, you can, you can understand that. You can hear him and understand what's going on in his head. So that's the hardest part, I think. I, I said that, that this is, this isn't an Errol Morris film, but it's it's still quite different from your father's other work. Um, it, it's also his shortest film <laughs> and his first in quite a long time. And it, yes, and it's his first movie for theatrical <coughs> release in more than thirty years. Uh, but tell me some of the other differences. I mean, I was thinking even in terms of the, the rhythm of the interrogation, how you uh, cut from one to another to to just unroll the narrative, or some of the things that you were doing. There's no voice. Uh, there's right. no voiceover, of course. There are no archival photos. I mean, there are photos, but it's there are no it's letters. I mean, right. the classic right. trademarks. I mean, <laughs> yes. Part of it is just, in some ways, by necessity, because it's a much more contemporary story. It's a different yeah. kind of story. But we really felt like, and in part, going back to saying we have a film coming out of Raymond's interview, um, we always intended from the beginning to at least attempt to do the film without narration, which had been in every single other one of my dad's films before that. Um, and we felt strongly about that because we wanted the five to be able to tell their own story. And that's another thing is that often, you know, if your subject is someone who's long dead from generations ago, they're not telling their story. And no one, the people who are telling it are not eyewitnesses, they're historians or people who've studied it. And so in this case, we had people who could tell their own story and we had other eyewitnesses who'd participated in other ways in the story. Um, Jim Dwyer was covering it at the time. Um, and so that felt important. But also, I think we felt like the time period and the type of story just dictated a different style. So there's even, even down to things like there are um, not as many uh, moves, pans, zooms, tilts on the photographs that we do use than you might find in another Ken Burns film, I think. Um, and that's in part our editor's influence and in part our sense that we just ha wanted to have a slightly different relationship to these images. Like in, you know, in, in something like the Civil War, doing that helps you kind of bring to life something that's really distant um, and maybe harder to relate to. And in this, I think we just wanted you to have to confront it. Um, and that's a little bit different. And so I think we, we approached it differently. And we always wanted it to feel, I mean, even like the font is, is like the first time in 30 years that there's like a different font. <laughs> you know, it felt like we were just wanted to do something new. Uh, as is usual when any book is adapted for the screen, uh, you have to cut a lot. <laughs> Was there anything that you felt sorry to lose? I mean, for instance, there's this little bit in, 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 the, uh, in the book where we know that Matthias Reyes was actually seen by two detectives in the park that mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's in the book, and I like eye popping yeah. and post it uh, <laughs> <laughs> grabbing, and <laughs> but you can't really yeah. put that in. So, I mean, were there things that you felt sorry to lose? I mean, I, I mean that that's one that's one thing. Um, but 
you know, I don't know if there, it's as much about particular moments, but just feeling like there's so much more to, say, the trials and what happened in the trials and how those went and the lawyers and sort of how that all played out. Some things like that where it just feels like in the book there's so much more room to explore some of the nuances of what happened there. Um, but we really wanted to make a film that you could watch in a theater in one sitting. And so you can't, you can't as you said, you can't fit all of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just, I, it's funny, I feel like with, um, with a narrative film, often they say, you know, oh, you should read the book first before you go see the movie because, you know, you want to have your own. And I always felt like with this, it's actually the other way around mm -hmm. um, because it's not, you know, an actor replacing your own imagination. Yeah. It's the real yeah. person. And so you want to come and, like, meet these people and then you want their invest backstory in the story. And then you can, yeah. like, if you're interested, you can find out more. I feel like yeah. I'm doing an ad for the book. but No, but it, no, it's true. It's absolutely true. Yeah, you don't There's have... something you can sort of fill in some of these gaps and get, like, a deeper understanding of how some of these things actually happen, the interrogations. And also, um, to that point about the, about the trial, some of what's in the film is in part, I mean, mostly not, but is in part dictated by the challenges of how you visually represent parts of the story. So the trial is pretty hard to do in a film when there's no cameras in the courtroom. Like, you Just can these, only take sketches courtroom and sketches and stuff, yeah. so far. And so that's not to say that we necessarily would have done a much bigger section on the trials, but that is one challenge in the filmmaking process that's totally different when you're writing a book. You can spend as much time as you want on that. Um, and so that's that's one of those challenges. The interrogations also was a really challenging part of the story to depict visually. Ava DuVernay, famous for Selma, is making a five-part Netflix series about the Central Park Five. She's yeah. just put out a casting call. Yeah. Uh, it's scheduled for release in 2019. What do you think? I think it's great. I think it's any way that we can tell the story and continue to tell the story and continue to talk about it is wonderful. You don't so feel I'm proprietorial? No. About the I mean, material, I, your it's book? It's not my story, you know? <laughs> it's not, it's their story. And so I'm I'm happy for them. They're excited about it and they're participating in it. Oh, and the, I think the, the five? Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think that's um, great and I hope it's wonderful because I, I mean, I'm ha I, any chance that we have to continue talking about the story, I mean, this story is not um, an isolated case. And so um, I think there's always the opportunity to sort of use this story to think about these bigger questions about how our justice system fails, about how our media fails, about um, why this happens. And so I think there's, it's always relevant to continue talking about that. How much do you credit uh, President Trump for keeping the story alive? Yeah, um, not much, actually. I think, I mean, yes, I, I get those Google alerts in my inbox, and I think that's a lot to do with, with Trump, but um, I don't think that's why we're, I don't think that's why we're talking about it. It's just sort of one uh, unfortunate example of uh, why we can talk about it. I'm going to go to questions in a moment. The last, and please wait for the microphone to come. Um, not long ago, your father said that uh, all your films ask the question, who are we? What answer does the Central Park Five give? Or is it the saddest of any of the films? <laughs> yes, uh, may maybe in a way it's more, um, more pessimistic than some, but I think uh, Craig Stephen Wilder at the end of the film gives certainly one answer to that, which is we're not very good people. Um, and I think that's, in the end, um, one of the takeaways of this. But at the same time, I think, in focusing on the stories of the Central Park Five and seeing their, um, their resilience and just who they are as people. I mean, the thing that struck me most about meeting them was at the, uh, early on was that I had expected them to be angry. Like, I, I was angry. It's like, and they... Uh, they they obviously have anger, but it, that's not how they sort of manifest their experience with this, and that um, is to me a really beautiful and and hopeful thing that they have sort of come through this and are now, um, I think, finally moving on with their lives, and um, that's wonderful to see. Uh, questions? Where is the microphone? Here. 
right here. Hi, Sarah. Um, I'm to tell you that I am the cousin of Peter Noel, oh. former <laughs> Village Voice reporter. And so our question is, would the Central Park Five accept an invitation to the White House? Oh, Trump's. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I can't speak for them. I would assume the answer would be no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we actually tried. We actually asked Donald Trump for an interview um, while we were working on the film. And uh, we figured at the time, maybe the, uh, this is less, less true now, but at the time, the only time he ever sort of refused a, to, to talk to the <laughs> press, he said no. <laughs> Over there? I may have missed it, but I don't think the movie stated whether or not the defendants in the first trial took the stand. No, they did not. Why was it not referred to in the movie? Um, well, be, I, think, I think because they didn't, um, it was sort of not a... Um, I mean, I think if they had, we would have gone into more detail in there, but it's sort of their... You know their their option not to, and so it didn't feel like we needed to to explain that as clearly. Over here. Hi. Um. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed your book, and I love the film. And you're right; it's a very important thing to keep going. My question is: at the beginning of the film, you had a little note there that the city or the police or the prosecutors, you know, mm -hmm. refuse to. Um, go on to the film. Did you get any kind of pushback in any type of form from anybody, or did they just remain quiet once this film came out? And yeah, you know, we were, I think, prepared for pushback and kind of expecting it, and there actually wasn't that much. I think in part... Um, what about the subpoena? Well, yes, so there was that. So <laughs> while we were still making the film and while the civil case was ongoing, the city of New York... Um, subpoenaed us for they wanted the compl well first they asked for basically everything we'd collected in the process of making the film and then when we pushed back on that they they adjusted to basically what they were looking for were the com the unedited the raw interviews with the five and their family members the people who were um, plaintiffs in the lawsuit I think they were looking for any small contradictions between that and their depositions that could be used to try to um, undermine their credibility or something. Um, and we, um, you know, we weren't terribly concerned about the material itself and whether that would hurt their case, but it felt important not to just say yes. And we actually got a lot of really amazing support from the documentary community and the sort of journalism community because um, of the concern that that would you know that there there was already a kind of bad precedent around another documentary film who had had to turn things over in the course of a lawsuit and so there was this opportunity to really push back and we had to essentially prove that we were acting as journalists um and that we were therefore protected by the shield laws in New York for journalists which we did successfully and we did not turn over our material um which is funny I'm not sure I would have necessarily called myself a journalist or sort of thought about it in that way before. And then in this process, we really had uh, sort of came to own that in a different way. Um, so that was, that was one way. Um, but yeah, after the film came out, I think in part because we had a really great reception for the film and there was like a lot of, there was a positive response and I think it felt like it wasn't, it wasn't a great time for people, for these sort of voices to come out. I mean, we had, you know, there was like a screening that we did once in Albany and, you know, everyone had nice things to say. And then this one guy who I'm sort of assuming was a former cop, um, the way he talked about it, had a kind of rant about it. Um, but, it, you know, the room was not with him. And I think he felt that, and so it, it, there were these these moments where it it, it it felt like he was a sort of lone voice there, and it didn't it wasn't as much of a a problem as I think we were bracing ourselves for. Can you um, bring us up to date as to what they're doing now? Did they get careers? Did they go back for further education? And what kind of psychological support did they get? Yeah, um, so they all got um, 
they all pursued education while they were still in prison. And so they all got um, GEDs and not all, but they, I mean, they all were at least working towards college degrees and got either associates, in some cases, bachelor's degrees while G they were. GEDs like high school completion. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> um, they finished high school in prison, yeah, and, and then worked towards, towards higher education also until the funding for that was cut. Um, but they, and you know, they'd already, of course, been out for a long time when first before the convictions were vacated and then before the settlement. And so in to varying degrees and in various ways, they were sort of trying to put their lives back together. Um, so Yusef, not that long after he got out of prison, married, had three kids and divorced soon. It was sort of like the way he talked about it was like it was too soon. He like wasn't really ready and he was kind of rushing into trying to catch up with his life. Um, and that didn't work. But he now, um, so he has three daughters um, with his ex-wife, but he's now been in a relationship with his wife. Um, they've been together for a long time. And they have, she had also had three kids from a previous marriage, and they now have four kids together. And so they have this like huge blended sort of Brady Bunch family. Um, that's, that's really wonderful. And it was he, his, so she had some boys, but he had six girls and then the youngest one now he had a boy Yusef um so and they they live in Georgia and um he's actually he had al already had a, a really good job was working for a um a hospital in New York sort of running their technology systems these sort of wireless things that doctors uses to communicate and um was doing well but I think he's now um really just full-time kind of as activist and public speaker and involved in a lot of stuff um, like that. And a lot of them, Raymond Santana started, um, since the settlement, started a um, clothing line. Like he designs, he'd always wanted to be a fashion designer. He was really good at drawing as a kid and he they like make t-shirts and hats and jackets and stuff like that. Um, oh, it's funny because so. Yusuf's mother is a yeah, was teaches was a fashion Parsons designer and design. Yeah. <laughs> but he made those use of his innocent shirts. Yeah, right. um, yeah. So Raymond is like making T-shirts and doing this business, and um, he got married. Though he's since divorced. I'm sorry to say, but I, you know, it was actually kind of amazing. In in 2014, it was like in the span of a couple of like a couple of months, um, we like went to his wedding and. Got, and, and then they got the settlement, and it was like this whole sort of ama like amazing time for, for them. Um, Kevin got married a couple years ago and just had a baby last year, um, which is like the most wonderful thing, because he's like a, um, a teddy. I mean, he's like the sweetest human being, and th this idea, I think he wasn't sure if he would ever get to be a dad, but he'd obviously be an amazing dad, and so here he is now finally um, starting a family, and it's really great. Um, Corey is, um, has had the hardest time, uh, not surprisingly, maybe. I think he'd had the most difficult time even before any of this happened, and, um, you know, he has, he doesn't sort of communicate as clearly, you know, he has hearing problems that I think remain undiagnosed, um, or untreated, I should say, and, um, and so I think it's been hard hardest for him. Um, and I, I think I, I was always also most worried about him and people kind of trying to take advantage of him. Um, but he had his lawyer in the civil case really, they um, went beyond just sort of representing him in that case and I think really um, supported him in a lot of ways throughout that and sort of making sure he had those kinds of support structures and helping him with the money and structuring that and stuff. And so I think that's been been good, but I'm less in touch with him than, than with some of the other guys. And, you know, Antron, who's always been, um, you know, he wouldn't do an on-camera interview because I think in part he's so incredibly shy and also because he was afraid that people uh, at his work and who knew him would find out his story because he'd really sort of disappeared and gone to... Um, to Maryland. To Maryland and then to Georgia, but he, um, you know, he'd his name... Uh, McRae was his stepfather's name. It was actually not his legal name, but that's the name he was tried under. And so when he got out, he sort of reverted back to his legal name and his record didn't come up. And so he just didn't tell anyone. 
his story. And so he got job. He worked. He used to work as a forklift operator in a factory that you know warehouses at night and stuff like that. And he didn't tell anyone. And so he was even after he was exonerated, he was still kind of. Antron texts me on Mother's Day every year. You know, like, the, it's, the, the, it's the sweetest thing. Um, and so, yeah, so we've kept in touch. But, yeah, Corey, I think Corey has the um and the, You're, you're the younger time. than they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, but they all, I mean, Thanksgiving, they, like, all, they, they, they stay in touch when these big, I mean, that's the, the family thing. Like, they, it's, it, it was interesting. We, you know, after these many years, and even with the, the, by the time we did the interviews for the film, I think there was, as I said, some level of trust, and they were going to do these interviews. But I wouldn't say we were close. I wouldn't, we weren't friends. We, they, you know, I was, we were telling this story, and they were participating and telling and sharing their stories. Um, after the film came out, and then we started traveling around and sharing the film, and often some of them would come, some more than others. Again, Antron, he, I mean, he very shy, came to like one or two screenings, but um, that was the point where we sort of became friends and close and family um, as we shared the story and talked to people and and I think they could sort of relax a little bit. Like now the story is out there and it's okay. Uh, one last question right there. I'm grateful to be able to have a chance to speak to you. You know, we each just brought, and we divided up the interviews. We